<laughs> gone to the dogs? Not this town. It's gone to goats instead. Non-stop noise. And a baby on the way? That won't work. Time to call Pet Trainer 911. Find out the best tips for a road trip with your pooch on this week's Animal Attractions. Welcome to this episode of Animal Attractions, the show about the deep affection people have for their pets. It's also where you'll get the latest facts and tips from America's leading experts. And today, we're ready for a road trip, and we're going to show you how to make yours the best. Plus, have you ever lived next door to a constant barker? Imagine living in the same house as that noise. That's a job for our pet trainer, 911. Jennifer and A.K. Pimes have a new baby on the way. There's only one tiny problem. Daisy. She's a very sweet and loving dog. She loves to cuddle under blankets. Um, she always has to be touching one of us. And what happens is when she's not getting her way, when she can't be close to us, she starts to bark and cry. Daisy, quit that barking. You know, she's a great dog. She does usually the right things, but just the barking's really gets to me is that um, it's it's more of I'm thinking, okay, my wife's pregnant. I got a baby coming in the future now as well, too. And uh, thinking about having this dog, you know, interrupting her life for my little one, that's, uh, I can't that happen. I mean, she barks if we're on the telephone. <laughs> Hold on one second. Daisy, stop barking. Yeah, I'm sorry, that dog. Every time I get on the phone, she's barking. Or if we're laying in bed and she wants to get on the bed, or if someone comes to the door. She doesn't just bark once or twice. She'll, she gets louder as she keeps barking, and she barks and barks and barks and barks. The neighbors have you know two, three kids themselves. So, I mean, I'm sure it's, uh, it's waking up their, their kids as well, too. Daisy, stop! You guys are too loud. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. What are you gonna do? Daisy! You're gonna have a baby at home. I know, I don't know what to do. It's getting ridiculous. It's so loud. Have they woke Brad up any lately at all? They're pretty loud. If you're outside, you can definitely hear them. Oh, I'm so sorry. We, we've dealt with the problem this whole time, you know, because, you know, we love her and we don't want to have to, you know, get rid of her or anything like that. But... <laughs> She was sitting there at the couch and constantly watching TV, playing cards, constantly barking and barking. It's, it's embarrassing. Daisy? We had a friend who had a dog, and so our friends actually called George. And that's how we got the referral. Daisy's in control of her whole family. Daisy thinks that she's the number one top dog within the pack. It probably started every time she barks, she starts getting attention, so why not keep using this? Barking is a normal thing for a dog to do, but when you ask it to stop, it should stop at that point if it sees you as a higher level within the pack. Hi, Hi. I'm George. Hi, George, I'm Jennifer. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi. When I first met George, he seemed very confident, like he's going to be able to handle it, no problem. And of course, I'm thinking, I'm skeptical, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, right, it's not gonna work out. I noticed when I first came in that you were carrying her. You mentioned to me that when you walk the dog, the dog, a little thing like this is pulling you around, it's pulling you right. around and so on, a big guy like you and so <laughs> on. And if you're walking behind the dog, then you're basically the follower. So the dog's basically dictating throughout the rest of the day. It dictates, uh, I don't want anybody at that door. I want your neighbors to stay away from me and so on. And that's going to apply to everything else because uh, I feel that Daisy owns the both of you guys first. He comes once a week for six weeks. And if he feels like I'm not trained, <laughs> he'll, um, he'll continue until we're both trained and doing the right thing. So you want to start by tapping your left leg, Daisy, and just bring her. Come. 
when my left leg moves forward, it's going to bring the dog with me immediately. So the dog sees that immediately has to move when my left leg moves. I'm going to just turn around. Even right there, you see, she, said she decided to stop. She walked forward, right? Because I didn't give any resistance. The first thing I had to teach the family to keep the barking under control was for them to change the way Daisy sees them. For them to be at a higher level within the pecking order. By switching positions every time Daisy went ahead of us, we became important. Ask her from there to stay. The more things you have her do for you, the more you're building up leadership. I thought with Daisy that she was going to be hard to do because she's so stubborn and she wants to do her own thing. But I mean, as soon as George walks in, she's at his feet. There we go. Talk to her nice and pleasant. Okay, remember the tapping. That's her clue. At first, when George gave me a leash, I was kind of, you know, this is weird because I've never really put any training or any type of uh, time into Daisy. Even though I should, but I wasn't. So when he first gave me a leash, I was like, okay. The guys are around. Just bring her around. No hydroplane. And there we go. AK did very well with this process, but it's going to take him a little longer because uh, we're all creatures of habit. Just continue to do your homework, and every week you sh we should both start seeing results. Most dogs work on 60% of body signals, so they start picking up on our body signals, and if our body signals become important to the dog, then we really don't have to talk to it that much. At this point, we ask the dog to stay by switching our leash over to our left hand, giving it a palm signal with our right hand, which would also indicate to stay, move out with your right leg, and the dog should stay for you. Okay, so we just went over the leash uh, situation, leash control, so that the dog doesn't pull you and so on, and you want to apply the same technique basically to the door. So for example, if someone's ringing right now, and not necessarily would go for it the first time. That's what we've taught the dog. As soon as that bell rings, we all run towards the door. Let it ring once or twice, and then when you're ready, you invite her to go to the door with you. Daisy, come. So we show Daisy she can only go to the end of the carpet where she would immediately sit and wait there patiently for Jen to open the door. And go. Just walk. Daisy. That's what she learned. Stop her right there. Okay, stay. Drop the leash entirely. Okay. Drop it. Uh -huh. Turn, stay. Look, give her that nice body signal, nice and straight. Talk to whoever's out Hello? there. Be ready to correct. That's all. Don't worry. Just go ahead and correct. Correct. Don't bring back. Stay. Correct. Daisy. Not stay. Just a correction. Don't say her name. Just no. Stay. Stay. And look at your body signal. You're weak down here. You want to stand up nice and straight and say it nice and straight. When I first got the homework assignments, I was thinking, okay, I'm back in school or what's going on with this? But, um, you know, it was, wasn't that bad, really. It was, just, it was really, you know, you take 10 minutes out of your time and you take turns, you know. My homework assignment, um, one of them is if we're going to take her somewhere, we go out through the garage so that she doesn't run and bark out the front door. We never take her through the front door. Um, also, we keep her on a leash and she's supposed to be on a leash all day. You know, just we cut it so that it's smaller so that she just thinks that she has the whole leash on her. But when we're home, we put the bigger one on. And what happens is if she barks, then we just give it a little yank. Daisy, no. Practice, consistency, and patience is what you're practicing. So you're gonna put it through a 10 minute process. In the dog's mind, technically, since it runs around seven times faster, that's about 70 minute mental workout versus just a physical workout. At the same time, the owners are learning new habits on how to have better control, uh, better body positions and signals to the dog. I think George showed not just this, but me and Jennifer how to, how to quote unquote train a dog how to you know be with the dog and how to how to have have Daisy uh, listen to us. In most cases it takes about six weeks to uh, change the owners. The dogs take about two to three weeks and once we do that then uh, the the process is completed. Hey guys, how Hi are George, you? Hi George, how are you? Good, nice to see you Good again. to see you. When I approached, there was no barking at the door. Jen did not have Daisy in her arms, holding her back from making errors. Daisy knew exactly what to do, and that's to wait back by the carpet before running into tile. Where's that homework sheet that I left you last Actually, week? Get ready, George. Okay, let me see how that's looking. Oh wow, I'm seeing a lot of A's and B's from over here. That's very good. I see the door manners has improved. I see that the leash control has improved. 
the bargain is toned down. We're very happy with everything that um, Daisy has been taught. Um, we will keep, you know, reinforcing the rules with her so that she knows that we're the boss. Um, and I think that when the baby comes, instead of barking at the baby, she's going to be right there by the baby's side. Uh, Jen is a beautiful person, very soft, loving, and she was giving all that away to the dog for nothing. Now Jen's giving even more, but the dog is earning it. I mean, yeah, you could teach a dog how to how to sit and how to roll over, what have you, but to actually have your dog listen to you and and follow you and respect you more, it's a, it's a big thing. Having the proper training tool is very important on getting uh, the job done and actually dictating to the dog without being too hard or too soft. Uh, here we have our typical nylon collar. It'll work if the dog is basically a little bit on the submissive side. If the dog's a bit on the stronger side, I recommend two different type of collars. With this one here, it's what's called a training collar. A lot of people call them a choke chain, but when put on the correct way, it's a training collar. Always using the training collar as a P formation, and if you're not sure, you would put it on your left wrist as if it was the dog, and you give yourself a correction. Notice that it always opens back up. If it's on incorrectly, the first little tug or pull of the dog, it stays locked in. That will create damage to the dog. On more serious cases with dogs with aggressive issues or that want to bite other dogs, I like to use what's called a prong collar. It actually mimics mom's bite equally around the dog's neck. Uh, used the correct way, it'll have a softer touch when you give a correction than a training collar or your regular nylon leash. And for people who don't feel too comfortable with it, they always have these adjustable little tips that we can put on the prawn so that it basically uh, just feels a little softer uh, to the dog itself. So with any of these collars, please don't try to train on your own. Seek professional help from a professional trainer. Stay. Planning on hitting the open road with your best friend? Traveling with your pet can be a wonderful bonding experience, or trust me, a not so pleasant one. It all comes down to proper planning and preparation. Your first decision is whether or not to bring your pet along. Not all pets are good travelers. You know, the best thing to do is do a few practice runs close to home before you take off on a long journey. Harley and I love road trips. And today, we're heading to the Mecca of Mickey, Orlando, Florida. First thing, start healthy. The last thing you need is a sick pet when traveling. This means a visit to your vet for a medical checkup and ensure that your pet is up to date with all necessary vaccinations. The veterinarian can also issue a health certificate for your pet. If you or your pet will be traveling across state lines, you must obtain a recent health certificate and a certificate of rabies vaccinations. And many pet-friendly hotels require them as well. I attached a temporary ID tag to Harley. It includes the address and phone numbers of where we'll be staying, along with my cell number and an email address. This is one of the most important aspects of traveling with your pet, but also one of the most overlooked. In addition, bring along a current photo of your pet. A photograph will make it very easy for others to help you find your pet if he or she gets lost. It's not uncommon for dogs to like to stick their heads out the window. Well, how do I say this? Don't let them. Not only can debris fly up and injure your pet, it's also against the law in many states. So keep those windows up and throw on the AC. Harley and I have learned it's best to plan ahead, especially when it comes to accommodations. Pet policies are always changing, so Make sure you call ahead so you don't have any surprises when you get there. First, his specialized bedding. You know, he doesn't like to leave home without it. Harley! Here we go. Okay, most important, a first aid kit. Okay, in here we have scissors. We have some solution in case he needs to flush out his eyes. Cotton balls, gauze pads a cold pack, everything you can possibly think of, all right? His favorite toys, very important. Plenty of water, portable, collapsible water bins here. Extra collar, extra leash. 
and his favorite treats and favorite food. And there you have it. Rules of the open road. Very simple. Follow them and you will have a great road trip with your pet. Have you ever seen a bobcat and wished that your little kitty could have some of those exotic spots? Well, the Egyptian Mao has as many spots as any bobcat, and the cat inside this spotted coat is tame and friendly. The Mao is the only domestic cat in the world with naturally occurring spots. Egyptian Maos have a bright, affectionate personality and intelligence to spare. Some people swear that Maos are by far the smartest breed of cat they've ever owned. They're especially fond of toys, even as adults, and they'll use their exceptional intelligence to outwit anyone who tries to hide the cat toys where the cat can't find them. Some people say Egyptian Maos have the fastest reflexes they've ever seen, even fast for a cat. They'll often steal a toy right out of your hand before you can even wave it around. They've even been known to snag the prompting toy out of the judge's hand at cat shows. We've bred probably, I guess, six or seven different breeds of short hairs. These are the smartest we've ever had. They remember where the toys are hidden. They know where the food is. When we go traveling, they take their toys. They've unzipped a bag and gotten their toy out so they can play with it. Plus, their reflexes are extremely quick. They're the fastest I've ever seen in their ability to try and get something like a toy. The Egyptian Mile's dazzling spotted coat comes in three beautiful color patterns. The bronze has a brownish background with black spots. The silver has a silvery gray background with black spots. The smoke pattern is like a photographic negative of the silver light and dark spots on a smoky black background. Mouths of all colors have bright gooseberry green eyes, rimmed with black eyeliner type markings. The silver and bronze mouths have contrasting pink nose leather. They make great pets for households with older children and adults, but don't mix very well with very young children. The reason is, mouths don't enjoy being carried around, especially not by small, unsure hands. This is Mo. He's an Egyptian Mao. Mao means meow in Egyptian. They're considered one of the oldest breeds in the world. Their personalities vary as to their bloodlines. Typically, I found them to be quite independent, very easy to care for, and they bond more to one person than another. Basically, Mo just needs a brushing, an occasional bath, and a good nutritious diet. The Egyptian Mao is a fascinating animal, a decorative pet, and a loving friend. What more could you ask for? As dogs enter into their senior years, it is important to work with your veterinarian to assure proper and appropriate health care for the senior dog. Small dogs, typically at seven years of age, as well as large breed dogs at five years of age, are considered to be entering into a mature or senior stage of life. With senior pets, veterinarians typically would like to reevaluate your dog twice a year. Diets designed for senior pets contain ingredients that help them age more gracefully. As their activity level decreases, we also need to decrease the amount of calories in the diet. In addition to nutrition, it is important that we motivate them to exercise on a regular basis. Also important in the senior dog is proper dental health care. Dogs like people can develop problems with gingivitis, tooth decay, and periodontal disease. Key to good oral health is routine dental examinations by your veterinarian, routine cleanings, as well as your vet may recommend diets specifically to prevent oral disease. As with Geraldine here, who's 17 years of age, it is important as owners that we provide proper nutrition throughout the life of the dog, regular exercise, and most importantly, love for our pets. Are you a cat person or a dog person? That's a question you hear over and over again. But if you're in this little town in Tennessee, you're more likely to hear, are you a dog person 
or a goat person. At first glance, things look pretty typical in Lewisburg, Tennessee. Morning, Mayor! Morning, Lee! But actually, this town is going to, well, <laughs> the goats! <laughs> What I love about them is they are like medium-sized dogs with hooves. They are very sweet, they're easy to be with, and they're always happy. Each goat has its own unique personality. You hungry? Come here, bud. Buddy is the easiest one. He comes on in, and he'll stand around while I'm cooking. Then sometimes, like, he'll come up on the balcony and he'll just lie down. If I'm sitting there reading, he'll lie down, just like a dog. Ariel is different. She is affectionate with me, but she is afraid of people. When we are alone, she is the most affectionate out of the three goats in that she will rub her head against my head and she will actually kiss me here. Red, I think she's left out a little bit with the other two because they're siblings. She gets picked on the most, especially if I put food out for all three. She will be the last. So the only time she's close with me is if I have food. Otherwise, she doesn't need me. They first started coming in the house when I left this back door open, and they just walked on in, and at first they were sliding all over on my hardwood floors, and I thought it was real sweet. They were real good. They moved slowly, and if I'm moving slowly and not moving quickly, they're calm. Lots of times I like to have a picnic out here, and they will lie down next to me and just relax. So whether they're indoor or outdoor, they are really easy. I will go down and get my mail. And when I start walking up the driveway and they see, oh, mommy's got mail, and they will go after the junk mail and the newspapers. So if I'm sitting on the patio reading the paper, I can count that being gone because they'll start at the corners and work their way up. If you're going to get a goat, I suggest that you do vertical landscaping. Don't put anything on the ground because it won't last. So if you're looking at my house, everything's in hanging baskets, everything is hung off the wall. If you're going to have goats, have a rock garden. Lewisburg is the county seat of Marshall County and all feigning goats originated, uh, I think in the 1880s. Uh, in Marshall County and people were fascinated by this genetic disorder they had of myotonia which causes them not to faint actually but they get stiff-legged and if they're unbalanced they fall over and so people call them fainting goats. Because of the popularity of uh, the fainting goats originating here in Marshall County, Tennessee, uh, Tennessee has become the second largest goat producer in the nation. We didn't have a festival, and we started thinking about what we could do to celebrate. We hope to keep, keep it focused on something that's unique to Marshall County, and that's the, the fainting goats. That's why we call it the Goats Music and More Festival. I started working with the city on the Goats Music and More Planning Commission, and had a good time learning about goats. Um, didn't know much about it except growing up in Marshall County, you'd heard about fainting goats. And at the first festival, I saw this adorable little white pygmy goat and went up and petted her and she was so sweet and I said, I think I'd like to have a goat. <laughs> my goat's name is Camilla Parker Bowles, like the wife of Prince Charles. My name is Lee Bowles, so I wanted to keep it in the family. Camilla is the prettiest goat in Marshall County and that's just not my opinion. It was a contest and she, it was decided she won. Camilla is what I would call a true goat. Uh, she doesn't really like to be put on a leash and led around. She's friendly, but she's um, a little bit less domesticated than some. <laughs> Fainting goats are very docile goats compared to others, and they have sweet dispositions, especially if they are bottle fed when they're real little. I was surprised too at how affectionate goats are. They are wonderful companions in that respect. Of course, they're very social animals. Uh, uh, when you get ready to feed the goats, they just gather around you uh, and like puppy dogs. They, they love to, to jump up on you and uh, 
course, uh, a lot of times they'll get excited when you get ready to feed them. They'll just faint and fall over at the feed trough. Larry's got a great farm out there, and he's kind enough to let me go out anytime I want, have a little piece of the country, and I can bring my work and sit down and enjoy Camilla, just in, enjoy all the goats. The fainting goat in particular is, is not a, a big goat. They are gentle, and they'll eat almost anything, and they're friendly, they're good with grandchildren, and they're athletic. You know, if you get a female goat, they do not have that characteristic goat smell. And, and she, I have not washed her. She is self-cleaning. She preens like a cat. Make sure she's got water, and she can survive several days on her own eating anything. If someone is thinking about purchasing a fainting goat, the, the biggest, uh, most important thing I would recommend to them is go to a reputable breeder someone you know. Uh, health issues with goats are very important. It's surprising how they can understand me. And they know. They know when I'm being strict with them. They know when I'm in a playful mood. And they know when I don't want to be bothered. <laughs> so it's amazing how they pick up on language. And of course, the one language that everybody understands is the language of love. And they express it, and they understand it. We're so glad you could join us for this episode of Animal Attractions. And if you'd like any more information on the features you've seen here today, please visit our website at www.animalattractionstv.com. We'll see you next time. Bye.